So my name is Hal Bame. I'm CEO of MagnaChain. And just want to tell you a little bit about a new blockchain we've developed uh, specifically for gaming. So I've been in the gaming business for 15 years or so. Um, this by far, other than when mobile gaming started, I think this is the most exciting bit of the next era of gaming. It's definitely the only place gaming is going to be able to go. Um, if you look at mass, ad mass adoption of VR or hologram gaming, those are years away for real mass adoption. So we think this is the next era of gaming, and we spent quite a lot of time and effort over the last two and a half years developing this blockchain. Um, I've only got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to go fairly fast to this, but we're going to do Q&A after, and I'll be around afterwards to do some things. So how many people here have actually worked or are familiar with blockchain technology? OK. How many know the difference between blockchain, tech, and crypto? Same. <laughs> OK. For those of you who don't, um, there's no stupid questions when it comes to blockchain. Basically, think of it as blockchain tech is the underlying technology that makes crypto work. A bit like the internet is the underlying technology that makes websites work, or Amazon, or things like that. Crypto is currencies, which could be Bitcoin, or Ether, or 2,000, what they call altcoins, smaller coins out there. Everything else is kind of deeper tech. But that's the basic difference between the two, because I know that's sometimes a little confusing for people. Um, really, there's a, there's a huge amount of projects you hear out there, but very little when it comes to actually completed tech that has real-world use cases. This is one of the, the failures so far of the blockchain industry. It just hasn't been able to come up with real-world use cases that are being utilized or potential have to be utilized on a mass scale. Um, what we've done is focus on creating our blockchain specifically for gaming. So think of if Ethereum was built for gaming. That's basically what our goal is and what we've tried to achieve. Uh, CryptoKitties proved, obviously, it can work. But that was obviously an afterthought. It was not the primary purpose of, of Ethereum. So again, what, what we're focusing on here, hopefully this will hold on. This is not matching this. It will in a second. <laughs> OK, hopefully this is working. OK, so um, I'm sure many of you know this, but just a quick overview of global gaming and how it relates to crypto and blockchain technology. So. The latest stats were, you know, last year you're looking at $140 billion business, roughly. Mobile gaming is responsible for over half, continues to grow, the growing sector throughout the world. Um, about a third of the world's population are gamers. The definition, definition is a bit loose, but it means you play games once a week, once a month. You're familiar. You're somewhat regularly playing a game, regardless of what device or format you're playing on. Um, about one. Uh, so eSports is obviously booming, but out of $140 billion, it's only about a billion. Plus, it's very, very focused on five games, as most of you probably know. So eSports is what eSports has really done well, though, is begun to break into the mainstream, which is great. So I think we'll see massive growth continually on that, but it's going to be a while before it gets out of some of this hardcore stuff and into real mainstream things. Um, and of course, the, the CAGR, the compounded annual growth rate, continues to grow great. Now, the way this relates to blockchain is simple. To work in the blockchain or to be able to transact, you need to have a wallet, a crypto wallet. That wallet itself is where all, obviously, your cryptocurrency is going to be held. Right now, there's no definitive tracker of exactly how many wallets are out there. But the general thinking is there's about 25 to 30 million wallet holders. A lot of people have more than one wallet. So there might be 50 to 70 million wallets out there. But the general thinking is about 25 to 30 million crypto wallets out there. This is the main thing that has to increase for blockchain technology and crypto to go really massive on a global scale. There needs to be more wallets out there. So if you think businesses are great to run on a 1% conversion rate, that's it, when people say 10%, 20%, it's never going to happen. But if you work things on 1%, it can. So if you think there's two and a half mi a billion gamers out there, if you take 1% of that, you've doubled the amount of global crypto wallets out there currently. So this is why the industry as a whole in blockchain tech feels that gaming is probably one of the top two, if not the top sector in the world that can bring blockchain technology to the masses. So this is why now 
even versus like 12, 18 months ago, you're seeing an enormous growth in not just blockchain projects, but things coming online that are really actually functional and working um, in the gaming space related to blockchain. Um, the, other big, the other big thing here is, of course, monetization. So we've all been in gaming, I'm sure, a long time in the room. And you always hear about mobile gaming, maybe 2 3% monetized, give or take. Uh, Mobile game developers spend 90% of their revenue to keep 10% of their users, and of those 10%, 1% to 3% monetized, blah, 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 blah. With crypto, it's a little bit different. Crypto was based initially by Satoshi to do transactions. People are sincerely lent and naturally kind of gravitate towards moving money, moving digital currency. They are, it is built for this. So therefore, when you start putting the integration of crypto wallets into a game or a platform or an exchange or a marketplace, the, the propensity of a user to actually use that to spend money is going to be much, much higher than in a game that somebody might just pick up somewhere, play for free from their new Samsung phone. It's built for it. So the adaptation of wallets and the integration of blockchain technology means that you could see easily, easily, four or 500% increase in the monetized users. And even that's probably being conservative. CryptoKitties is a, a tricky example. Everybody alludes to it because it was the first game that kind of showed it was done. It was a crazy high amount. But you had a bull market in crypto. There were people with a lot of money. They were early adopters. All the Venn diagrams you know, kind of showed that crypto users, blockchain technology users, and gamers share something like 83% of the same traits, i.e. comfortable with online transactions, ready to take on quick technology, ready to be first early adopters. Um, it's probably not the greatest use case because it was, it was the first thing out there and it was, it was very exciting and there weren't a lot of games to compete. But it did prove that people are willing to spend money with games and tokenized, what they call non-fungible tokens, which you know we'll get into in a second. OK, so a bit like with Ethereum, the way they have what they call gas. This powers a transaction. I, you're a developer, a transaction's happened on your DAP, which could be a game or a marketplace or whatever it is. You have to pay to power that transaction. And these are infinitesimal amounts of money compared to the 30% that Apple or, or Google takes on their stores. It's a very small amount of money, another big advantage of crypto. So our version of this is, as we see here, Magna. So it's our own token. Um, it's what's going to power our transactions. This is what game developers will kind of pay, and again, in very small amounts, you're talking like single digit cents in most cases, to power their transactions through our blockchain. Um, what, what we're looking at, which is the cool bit, is other use cases. You hear a lot in blockchain about utility coins or security coins or whatever. In gaming, you need to prove that your coin or your token actually has a use case. So we've got some pretty cool ideas here of how to use it, not just in-game currency, for example, but there's ways that we could use our tokens with other tokens for interoperability. We can use our blockchain to work with other blockchains. We could even use our token to reactivate some types of currency or games that have maybe have gone stagnant or went out of business or things like that. Because a lot of people, as you know, can get a little bit disappointed if you spent hundreds or thousands of hours on a game and guess what, company went bust and you're sitting on a billion dollars of worthless tree tokens or, or gold or whatever it's going to be. So these are some of the things we want to do to come up with really innovative uses of our token. Also, as the market has proven, during a bull run in crypto, developers can raise a lot of money. Um, so far, the only token you've been able to do that with is ERC-20, Ethereum's token. What we want to do is create such a scale on our blockchain in an ecosystem with thousands of developers using it, they could also use our token because if you're a game developer, it makes much more sense to use a token that's used by other game developers and other consumers and grow your community immediately. So we're hoping that our token get enough traction where it can actually be a way that developers can, can fund their own development business. OK. Um, with, part, with, with everything, just like any other business, the business of crypto and blockchain technology is really important with the partners you have. So we're a Singapore-based company. Um, I was living there forever, and uh, basically what we want to do is focus on these markets that are not just big in gaming, but also big in crypto. Now, one of the things that's happening in crypto you'll probably read about is regulation. 
and everyone's like, oh, regulation's coming, it's terrible, no more cowboy stuff. This is a good <laughs> thing. With regulation comes Wall Street money and other, high, other in institutional money around the world. It's going to make, when crypto was at its peak in January 2018, Bitcoin was around $20,000. Okay, now it's about 3,500 or something as of this morning. But most people got hit. 80 to 90% of their holdings were wiped out in 2018. Um, this was actually a very healthy correction in the market. And now what you're seeing is in the US, in Singapore, in Switzerland, Germany, Thailand, all the major countries around the world, you're starting to see regulation. And this is a very good thing because it's a bit like dot com, early, early internet marketplaces, e-commerce, websites in the early 90s, there were a lot of scams. Most of them, more than anywhere, was in the U.S., where people think, oh, everything's so straight and regulated there. It's not. But the U.S. is like king of the scams, because <laughs> they always get the, the first adopters in first. So what you're seeing now is the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, financial crimes, all starting to regulate things. Guess what? That makes a big Wall Street bank or a pension fund for teachers' union that sits on $4 billion and every year puts 1% into something risky, which might be, you know, property in, in, in Bali or, or a new technology in Eastern Europe or whatever it is. But they put 1% in a high risk. It is going to make, when regulation comes in, which is happening now as we're sitting here in all these markets, it's going to make the peak of the crypto market, which was about $830 billion at its peak in January last year, a year, literally a year ago from today, it's going to make that look like nothing. It's going to be a multi-trillion dollar business. And it's only going to grow, whereas your classic commodities businesses are, are obviously you know, nickel, aluminum, things like that, not that great. And so you're going to start to see crypto become this new asset class that's regulated, bringing in enormous amounts of money. And all of that is going to be looking for real-world use cases. And that is where gaming can position itself kind of as the, as the number one spot. So back to partnerships, what we do is look for mass partnerships. Obviously, if we went to every game developer in the world, it would take us 20 years. So we try to work with partners who are either strategically big and have a lot of kind of footprint and history in certain target markets for us, or we can reach thousands of developers or millions of developers at once. So one of our, our big first investors with the Nine, they were the original licensee of World of Warcraft in China. They literally built it from nothing. And in 2004, when they started out, trust me, MMO in China was zero. And they built it up to a, you know, I think on the NASDAQ at one point, they were worth a couple billion dollars. So they, they're like, they've been around 20 years. They really know their stuff there. Um, we do roadshows in China every month, just kind of getting people together, teaching about blockchain technology. And now all of our tech is open source on GitHub. People can just see our code and look through it. We have a huge developer onboarding site at our website, and you can look through all of this. So it's about kind of having these get-togethers and meetups and getting people comfortable with stuff. So China is obviously a really, really important market for us. Regulatory there is very difficult right now. It's very gray. Uh, cryptos had their fair share of scams, but it was the same thing in mobile gaming some years ago. In fact, even now, you can't get a new mobile license for a game if you're a developer. But China tends to do this, and then they come back, they figure out how the ministries are going to control things, and then everything takes off again. The same thing will happen with crypto. Um, moving on, our number one target moment right now, market right now is Korea um, for two reasons. One, gaming's been going there for mass, massive, on a massive scale for 20 years. I mean, some of you have sure have seen pictures of StarCraft competitions in stadiums of 50, 80,000 people with big screens. It's insane. At one point, they had seven terrestrial TV channels dedicated to StarCraft. It's crazy. Um, so really kind of the home of eSports. Um, the other thing that Korea has is an enormous, enormous audience of a retail investor community, meaning individual investors. You know, mothers there, are families are sitting on crypto. It's crazy. You've never seen anything like it. Um, we have some really great partnerships there. One is the Korea Mobile Game Association. They want to move um, their 700 de developer base all onto the blockchain, so we're partnering with, the, with them. We're also partnering with a company called, uh, I'm going to move a little quicker because I'm running out of time, um, iPeoples. They did the monopoly of Korea. They licensed it in 1982. They basically um, are, want this game on the blockchain. And they're already developing it. It's looking excellent. So this is these kind of big IPs and big developer associations. We want to hopefully help us scale much, much quicker that way. Um, 
Fest. We've also got here Fun Block Factory, one of our one of our first uh, gaming partners, where you know we're looking to bring on a couple of early alpha games to just test things out uh, as we scale, grow security, stability. These are the two most important things as we grow the company itself. Um, and of course, we've got uh, Alto.io, um, who have a, a kind of digital asset marketplace where they create the digital assets for game developers. And this is one of the really cool things about the blockchain technology integration with gaming, is that with their developers and with the assets, one asset can be used across multiple games. The big, one of the biggest things when people talk about the advantages of blockchain technology and gaming, one of the biggest things you can have is the fact that players for the first time can earn real money from the assets they hold. And previously, you'd have some kind of dodgy third-party ecosystem where people could trade their assets in the shadows. Now they don't. So it's digital assets and what's created and used in, in the games themselves. One, can be used across multiple games in some cases. And two, if I own that asset, Blizzard or Tencent, they, won't, they can't tell me how to, use, how to do it. I can trade it, sell it, buy it, distribute it however I want, wallet to wallet. And then as I take that asset, I can convert it on an exchange for real money. So it's play to earn. And this is, this is a huge fundamental shift from the players and the developers' point of view. Um, the other thing is, of course, developers normally have to pay enormous amounts of revenue share for distribution around the world or you know, advertising, a share of voice, not just the app stores like Apple and Google. But you know, in China, if you're doing a deal with Tencent, they might take up to 80% of your revenue. It's very difficult to keep going, but you need a company like that for global or national distribution in a market like China. With crypto and blockchain technology, you don't. You just need to grow your community. There are plenty of games, there's three game developers I can think of right now that are making high five figures, low six figures every month with communities as small as 1,000 people. And that's proving that like the ARPUs you can get and blockchain technology and things like and, and this kind of integration is going to just blow away anything we've seen before in terms of the percentage of people spending money and the rate that they spend money at. So this, this kind of adoption of monetized users where you're really making it interesting use cases of how crypto can be integrated in your game will, will fundamentally change things and it will all revolve around digital assets and what they call non-fungible tokens which are say a crypto kitty where there's only one. It's promoting scarcity. Scarcity promotes value. So these to this non-fungible tokens and use of big IPs are two areas where we think are really going to grow gaming for the masses and blockchain technology. Um, some of our other partners here, just to get the snapshot, this is not all of them. You got Monetizer, which is a game reward engine. Funblock, which I mentioned. Different game associations, not just in Korea. Um, obviously, game engines, Unreal, Agricia, Unity. Working with all these companies gives us access to millions of developers at once, not just thousands. So we're just about to start launching some campaigns with them. And, and this gets the word out, not just about MagnaChain, but about blockchain technology in general. And it allows us to reach an enormous amount of developers very quickly, which it's simply impossible to do one by one. Um, lastly, we're getting to the end here. Some of the game develop, uh, sale global de business development and support centers. Gaming is 24-7. We need to have meetups in all major cities as much as possible. So in 2019, we're going to start some of our meetup schedules. These are the, kind of the core cities and areas we're looking at, where we want to bring people in, small informal meetups, might be once a quarter to start, and we're just teaching people about MagnaChain and blockchain technology, um, and also helping to service the game developers or marketplace developers or whatever it's going to be that's sitting on our blockchain so they can figure out the best ways to maximize their DAP, decentralized application, on our blockchain itself. Um, some of the things we're doing to promote ourselves, which is now really kicking into gear, um, obviously gaming conferences, we've been at many of these. Um, we're going to continue to do that in 2019. We've got lots of PR. PR and community management is much, much, much different, it's much broader um, than in classic kind of mobile game marketing or things like that. You really have to do it country by country. Um, we've got teams set up to do all that. Our community building, um, focusing on a lot of the blockchain things, but now we're starting to get into some of the gaming sites and, and some other things as well. And we, our goal is to sometime, maybe in the second half here of 2019, start our quarterly MagCons where we're kind of bringing together larger audiences. We might do that in partnership with some of the game engines. We might do it on our own. But the idea is to do these kind of conventions where we're bringing 
you know, lots and lots of game developers together at once solely focused on MagnaChain and blockchain technology. Um, just some of our team, you can see that they've worked with some of the biggest companies in, in the world, especially in China here, and we've got about 13 game developers right now. Most of the development's based in Guangzhou in China, but we've got partners and team members in Europe, the US, and really quite global, so we can take advantage of all the opportunities globally. And one of the things that we also want to focus on a lot are competitions. We want developers to come up with ideas. They need to be real. So ideally, we're looking think for things that are actually at some kind of alpha or beta stage, but even conceptual ones, where we'll be running competitions throughout the world. The first one we just announced in Korea, and you've got prizes with monetary prizes and prizes with our tokens, where we can really get the developers incentivized to start taking some, some risks in terms of their resource to develop blockchain games and, and focused on the MagnaChain blockchain. So um, if you have any questions, we can do some now, and then I'll be around today and tomorrow also. Um, our website's at the top where you can see everything about us the, from our developer on onboarding site, which is like a 101 for blockchain technology and MagnaChain, to our GitHub where you can actually look at the source code, to looking at our SDKs and everything else we're doing there. So um, and our communities are here at the bottom, but everything's kind of linked up on our website there. So I guess I think I'm out of time. So we can do a few questions yep, now. Sure. We just wait for the microphone. You just, if you can wait for the microphone. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And then say say who you oh, are, cool. where you're from. Okay. Yep. Oh, hi. Uh, Mark Eisenstadt from uh, Decent Games. Uh, thank you very much, Hal. That was very uh, exciting and extremely clear. I got to say. Just a quickie. Having also heard um, Roy's quite exciting presentation from Tron. I have a, a gut reaction of, uh, of um, let's say, concern about these massive silos developing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes against my sensibilities about the, that got me into the blockchain world. Is that a false concern? I mean, you mean silos in terms of? Silos in terms doing. of, I see a magna chain world, I see a Tron world already, just from whatever well, I, today. I, I, but do I, I you guys, you, are yeah. you guys uh, working together? Are you rivals? Where, how does, should I be concerned about silos? It doesn't match what got me into the blockchain world. Yeah, I mean, look, people cannot. Companies are companies, and they're gonna they're gonna do things on their own. Yeah. The difference is, so I used to run PlayStation uh, International, kind of between Germany and China for years. If you had told me then, when I was doing that, that you'd be able to play the same game on PlayStation, Xbox, and Wii, i.e., Fortnite, or other games, I'd say you're crazy because I knew the corporate barriers between. With blockchain tech, I think I think it's you're not going to see that. Of course, at the beginning, everybody's doing their own thing because we're developing our own blockchains, we're developing our own ecosystems. Um, I know the Tron guys; they're doing some really cool stuff, especially when it looks at bit, look at BitTorrent. I mean, that's a hundred million people they can bring into blockchain, use it with crypto wallets and stuff like that. That's great. So I hope we're sitting here next year and there's 30 blockchains developed, you know, devoted to gaming. It's good for everybody because I, re I remember when I was doing PlayStation Eastern Europe, there were no other budgets. There were no other market. It was just us. And it's tough. So I think interoperability is a really important thing. We're looking at bringing our tokens, exchanging, compatible with others, but we also want to work with other blockchains. You know, whether it's, you know, uh, I know some people at Zillica, we're talking to Ethereum, whatever. There's no, there's no reason you can't. It's purely technological that stops you from doing that. So it's really about the experience you'll have on each blockchain, which is going to make the player or the developer enjoy it more or less. But I think at the beginning, this is really early days. You're going to see some silo effect, of course. But I think eventually, you're going to see the barriers break down much faster than you did in other areas of video game, because you don't have these massive companies behind it where there's a lot of resistance.